over 20 years now. And thank you to United Chinese Americans for um, inviting me to join you here today, and thank you to my good friend Ariane Ong for specifically inviting me. Um, and congratulations to UCA uh, for convening its second national convention. Your message of empowering the Chinese American community through civic engagement and embracing the rights and responsibilities of United States citizens is an inspiring one. Fifty-five years ago, a young man and a young woman left their homeland, crossed the Pacific Ocean, and set foot on American soil for the first time in search of the American dream and American freedom. Forty-five years ago, they entered an American courtroom for the first time, stood before a judge, and took the oath as United States citizens. Four years ago, that no longer young man and woman, my parents, entered a courtroom at the United States District Court in Maryland and witnessed their son take the oath as a United States District Judge. <laughs> only, only in America. The federal judiciary is one of three branches of government established by the United States Constitution. Article three of the Constitution created the United States Supreme Court and authorized the lower federal courts consisting of the U.S. District Courts including the court I sit on, which hear federal cases at the trial level, and the United States Courts of Appeals, which review our decisions and from which cases can be appealed to the Supreme Court. Under the Constitution, federal judges are nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate, and they serve a lifetime appointment, assuming good behavior. Although the federal judiciary dates back more than 200 years to the founding of our nation, for much of our history, there were no Asian American or Pacific Islander judges on the federal courts. The first Pacific Islander judge, a native Hawaiian, was appointed in 1961. The first Chinese American federal judge, Dick Yin Wang, was appointed by President Ford in 1975 to serve on the United States District Court for the District of Hawaii. Out of the over 800 federal judges serving today, just 29 are Asian American and 11 are Chinese American. So how did I, as the son of Chinese immigrants, become one of these judges? My family's journey is both uniquely and universally American, perhaps much like your family's story. My parents came to America from Taiwan seeking freedom and opportunity in the 1960s. My dad came for graduate school, and with the passage of the Immigration Act of 1965, he had the opportunity to stay in America and he and my mom did, embarking on a career in research and as an academic. My sister and I were born in America and we eventually settled near Boston, Massachusetts. But at some point, because of economic realities, my parents felt the need to also follow the traditional immigrant path of running small businesses to make ends meet. While we were able to live in a middle class town with good public schools, my sister and I would sometimes help out with the family businesses on weekends and during school vacations. But through grit and determination, my parents were able to support us as we grew up and put us through college. Now, I had always tried to be a good Chinese son. I played the violin. I, I studied hard. And I even got into Harvard. Despite that, I was, in other ways, a disappointment. You see, early in college, I declared to my parents that I had no interest in being a doctor or an engineer. And later in college, I decided I wanted to become a lawyer. In many families in America, a child announcing that he or she wants to become a lawyer is a cause for celebration. But my dad tried to talk me out of it. Like many Chinese Americans of his generation, he did not think we could compete in the legal field whether because of the language, cultural biases, or other factors. But I wasn't that good of a Chinese son because I insisted on charting my own course. And what was it that led me to that path? Perhaps it was growing up in Lexington, Massachusetts, where the American Revolution began, and being inspired by the origin story of America. Perhaps it was getting involved in student government in high school, and then running for and getting elected to a position in my hometown's local government while I was in college. Or perhaps it was coming to Washington, D.C. while in college 
for an internship with Senator Ted Kennedy on the Judiciary Committee, which oversees the courts. Or maybe it was growing up as only one of a handful of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans in my hometown. Though I had a very positive experience growing up and still have very close friends from high school, I always knew I was different. Maybe it was being asked time and again, where are you really from? That made me want to participate in our government so there would be no question that I belong and to be in a position through the law to protect the rights of those who are viewed as different. So I embarked on a career not just in the law, but in public service. Again, disappointing my parents who thought that I should take the highest paying job available, which would have been working as a lawyer for corporate America. After law school, I got a position as a civil rights lawyer at the United States Department of Justice, bringing cases to enforce anti-discrimination laws to protect the rights of African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and persons with disabilities. I later became an assistant U.S. attorney, a federal prosecutor, where I got trial experience in federal court. After a stint at a private law firm, I worked as an attorney in the U.S. House of Representatives in the legislative branch, and then the U.S. Department of Homeland Security in the executive branch during the Obama administration. Then, in 2013, President Obama nominated me to serve as the United States District Judge in Maryland, where my wife and uh, I had settled with our kids. When I was confirmed by the Senate in 2014, I became the first Asian American federal judge in Maryland and in what is known as the Fourth Circuit, the subdivision within the federal courts, which includes the states from Maryland down to South Carolina. So what is it that we as federal judges do? Well, the federal courts hear criminal cases arising under federal law ranging from drug trafficking cases to public corruption cases, and civil cases raising claims under the Constitution or any federal laws, as well as cases between parties from different states, even if they arise under state law. These cases can range from business disputes, patent cases, and antitrust cases, to civil rights cases alleging discrimination based on race, sex, national origin, or disability, police misconduct cases against citizens, or violations of federal labor laws. They include claims that laws violate constitutional rights, like the right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and equal protection of the law. We even have cases challenging the constitutionality or legal authority for actions by Congress, the President, and federal agencies. At any given time, I oversee approximately 350 cases, criminal and civil. My duties include conducting pretrial hearings in criminal and civil cases, reviewing and ruling upon motions, often by drafting and issuing lengthy written judicial opinions, presiding over jury and non-jury trials, and sentencing criminal defendants. Beyond the day-to-day -day work, perhaps my most meaningful and rewarding duty is presiding over naturalization ceremonies for new Americans, including Chinese Americans. Every time I do so, I tell the new citizens that when a family can, as mine has, move in a single generation from taking the citizenship oath before a judge to administering the same oath as the judge, you know that in America, anything is possible. So why should Chinese Americans care about the judicial branch and its work? Well, one of the most important roles of the federal courts is to interpret the Constitution and laws of the United States and apply them to cases in which individual rights are at stake, including those of Chinese Americans. Throughout American history, courts have been the last best hope for justice, even when the political process fails to protect those rights. You may have heard of Brown versus Board of Education, the landmark Supreme Court case in which racial segregation in public schools was found to be unconstitutional, or Korematsu versus United States and related cases in which Japanese Americans fought against the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, at first unsuccessfully, but were ultimately vindicated just this year when the Supreme Court formally disavowed its 1944 ruling upholding the internment. But it is less well known that there are other important cases in American history in which the rights of Chinese Americans have been at stake. And Chinese Americans fought for their rights in court and have, as a result, protected the rights of all Americans. In 1886, in a case called Yik Wo versus Hopkins, a San Francisco law against the operation of laundry businesses in wooden buildings was found to have been enforced only against Chinese business owners. 
When a Chinese business owner was charged with violating this law and challenged it in court, the Supreme Court found that the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection of the law prohibits discriminatory application of otherwise neutral laws based on race or nationality, a principle that still applies and still is applied by courts today. In 1898, in a Supreme Court case called United States versus Wong Kim Ark, during the time that the Chinese Exclusion Act was in effect, a man born in the United States to Chinese parents went to court to fight his exclusion from the United States and establish the principle that under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, any person born in the United States, including someone of Chinese descent, is necessarily a citizen of the United States. So all Americans born to immigrant parents, including me, owe the guarantee of our citizenship to a case brought by a Chinese American. So we as a community have a little known but proud history of accessing the courts to protect our rights. But there have been setbacks, too. In 1982, Vincent Chin, a 27-year-old Chinese-American, was murdered by two men who were angry that Japanese cars were causing the loss of auto worker jobs in, Detroit, in the Detroit area. And they mistakenly thought that he was, Vincent Chin was a Japanese-American. Although the perpetrators were convicted, the state court judge sentenced them only to probation. The US Department of Justice brought a federal civil rights case against one of the men and secured a conviction, but it was overturned on appeal. Today, like Wong Kim Ark and Vincent Chin, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans more broadly are directly affected by the court system with more and more frequency. Asian Americans now represent 6% of the population in the United States. In my home county of Montgomery County, Maryland, we now represent 15% of the population and are the fastest growing population in the county, state, and nation. This diversity is reflected in the work of our courts. In my time as a judge, it has been eye-opening to see the number of parties who are Chinese American or Asian American, including plaintiffs in employment discrimination cases, uh, such as scientists who work in federal government agencies in this area who believe that they've been treated unfairly. They include Chinese American plaintiffs in social security benefits cases who have not been receiving what they believe they deserve. And we've had Chinese American small business owners as defendants in cases, in wage and hour law cases, regarding how they're paying their workers. Even beyond parties, we see Chinese American and Asian Americans in the courts as witnesses, sometimes victims of violent crimes, such as armed robberies of their own small businesses. More and more, we see Chinese and Asian American lawyers in the courtroom and, and, and members of the jury. And as we have seen too all, all too often in the news, Chinese Americans can end up as defendants in criminal cases as well, including as a result of investigations into alleged espionage on behalf of China. When such cases are brought, it is federal courts, federal judges, and federal juries that will ultimately decide the fate of these Chinese Americans. And as has been the case throughout our history, the public issues making their way into the courts also affect Chinese Americans. As you heard earlier, I recently had a case before me relating to the current administration's travel ban on individuals from certain predominantly Muslim countries. Although the policy did not involve countries in East Asia other than North Korea, the issues presented have implications beyond that one policy. For example, in that case, it had to be decided, and ultimately the Supreme Court decided on review, whether an American citizen or resident has the right to bring a lawsuit to challenge an immigration decision that adversely affects a family member in another country, an issue that could affect anyone who has family overseas who may seek to come to America. So the courts have always mattered to Chinese Americans, and they matter as much or more so today. It's therefore important that the courts be accessible to all and treat all fairly and equally. For those of us who grew up in immigrant families, we understand that not everyone in America looks the same or speaks English well or understands American culture and the American legal system or has the same economic resources as everyone else. But for our justice system to work, it must be the case that no matter what you look like or where your family came from or how hard your name is to pronounce, that you can receive justice in America. It must be the case that no matter how much money you have or how much you know about our legal system, that you can receive justice in America. We must all do our part to ensure that everyone, regardless of circumstance, is treated fairly and equally in our courts. 
So while Chinese Americans continue to make significant contributions to America in science, engineering, medicine, and now business, it's important for us to be full participants in the justice system as well. It's important for Chinese Americans to become attorneys, whether in the private sector, the government, or public interest organizations. A recent study by the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association showed that from 1983 to 2013, law school enrollment by Asian Americans uh, almost quadruple, more than quadruple. But since, and now Asian Americans are 7% of law students, more than we are in the population. But since 2013, the number of Asian Americans enrolling in law schools has declined significantly by 43%. Although enrollment went down across all groups, likely because of the recession a decade ago that had an effect on the legal job market, at least temporarily. That drop is more significant for Asian Americans than for any other group. But being an attorney is not just about a high-paying career. It's also about being ready and able to defend someone's rights. Remember when Wen Ho Lee was accused of espionage in the late 1990s, among the attorneys who stepped forward to represent him, were Chinese Americans. And then Chinese American attorneys should aspire to become judges. We've had remarkable progress in recent years. In our history, there's only been 46 Asian American federal judges, including 16 Chinese Americans. But more than half of those judges, 27 Asian Americans, including 10 Chinese Americans, were appointed in just the last 10 years. Nine of these 10 Chinese American federal judges were appointed by President Obama alone who more than tripled the number of Asian American federal judges during his time in office. And while the earlier Asian American judges were usually appointed to serve in Hawaii or California, today Chinese American judges serve not just in Los Angeles and San Francisco, but in New York, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., in Texas, Nevada, and Maryland, where I serve. And there are also Asian American federal judges in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. And even if you're not an attorney or a judge, Chinese Americans can and should support the justice system by providing support to legal services organizations and other groups that serve our community and Asian Americans more broadly on issues involving the law. When Asian Americans encounter discrimination, have immigration difficulties, are victims of domestic violence or other crimes, or end up in business or landlord disputes, they often lack the resources, language skills, an understanding of the legal system needed to ensure and reach successful outcomes. Organizations like the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center here in Washington, D.C., and others across the country help low-income, limited English proficient Asian Americans and immigrants overcome the language and cultural barriers to accessing the court system by directly representing them or by assisting them in finding attorneys and interpreters to help them navigate the courts. Chinese Americans of all backgrounds should support these organizations across the country that help our community access justice. Now there's still a ways to go until Chinese Americans and Asian Americans are full participants in our legal system. As in other sectors, although we have now established a meaningful presence in the legal profession, we are under, underrepresented at the highest levels, whether among law firm partners or tenured law professors, but also among judges. The 29 Asian American federal judges I mentioned represent tremendous progress in recent years, but that we still represent only 3% of federal judges, uh, where our pop we represent 6% of the population overall. There's never been an Asian American United States district judge in 40 of our 50 states, or in seven of the 13 United States courts of appeals. And as we all know, there's never been an Asian American justice on the United States Supreme Court. But that day will come. Today, we have a, a Catholic with Irish roots, an Italian-American, three Jews, an African-American, and a Latina serving on the Supreme Court of the United States. For each of their communities, there was a time in American history when it was unthinkable that one of their own could serve on the Supreme Court. So whether it is increasing representation among judges generally, or someday having an Asian American or Chinese American justice on the United States Supreme Court. The road is long, there will be setbacks, but the history of America tells us that with hard work and collective resolve, it is not a matter of if, but of when. 
Now, it's not that Chinese, judge, Chinese American judges or Asian American judges would decide cases differently, but having a justice system that looks like the community it serves is important to build and maintain the public's trust that our courts will protect the rights of all Americans. And having a stronger presence on the bench is one of the most significant steps we can take to demonstrate that we are full members of the American community. If we can be trusted to administer justice in America, it is another powerful sign that this is our country too. And more broadly, full participation in our justice system across the board, perhaps more importantly than anything else, will demonstrate to others that we are full-fledged Americans. Ultimately, it is not our military might, economic success, or scientific innovation that sets America apart from other nations historically. It is our ideals. Being an American is not about what you look like or where your family came from or how long your family has been here. It's about believing in the, and embracing the fundamental values of this country. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, due process of law, the understanding that in America the rule of law governs and that a citizen's fundamental rights cannot be taken away except through legal process that includes protections like a trial by a jury of fellow citizens. And equal protection of the law. The belief as set forth in our Declaration of Independence that we are all created equal, and the principle that we have forged in the years since, that regardless of your race, sex, religion, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, or any other apparent differences, you have the same rights and opportunities and deserve to be treated with the same respect and dignity as everyone else. It is our adherence to these ideas enshrined in the Constitution that sets America apart from the rest of the world. It is these values, ultimately, that drew my family here, and perhaps yours. Whenever I asked my father why he left behind his home country to take a chance on America, he always answers with a single word, freedom. They came here for freedom. You see, for my parents' generation, their homeland of Taiwan was under martial law as they grew up. One of my grandfathers was detained for political reasons. So they understood, and we understand, that not everyone in the world lives under a system where the rule of law governs, where individual rights and due process of law are protected, and where we aspire to equal justice under law. It is to protect and improve our system of justice and what it represents to those around the world that is our work as federal judges. But it's not only judges with this responsibility. It is our elected officials. It is attorneys. And most importantly, it is citizens, including Chinese American citizens. Together, we must take up the challenge in all we do to uphold our Constitution, advance the rule of law, and expand the reach of justice broadly and equally so that we will always remain a beacon to those around the world, like my parents did half a century ago, who believe in liberty and justice for all, and look to America to find it. Thank you again for inviting me, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Judge Chang. Now we have about 10 minutes to have a Q&A session. I will use the liberty to ask you the first question. Okay. And there is another mic. Uh, uh, Joy has the mic. And when you ask a question, please be brief and to the point. So my question for you, as you said, Judge Tron, um, Asian Americans are less represented in the position of authority, but you are in a position of authority. Have you had any experience where uh, your authority is being challenged because of your appearance or your last name? Well, um, I can't say that there's a specific incident. I think I would say that, you know, when I was appointed when I was uh, 44, um, but, and that's not an unusual age for a judge, but I think uh, it took a little getting used to. There were a couple times in the courthouse where people thought I was one of the law clerks, which is one of the recent law graduates who uh, work for the judges. Um, I guess it was good that they thought I might have been 20 something, but uh, um, I think that's something that people take a little getting used to. Um, and I think whenever you're new, there was test you a little bit more than other judges. So I don't know if that's something that's about my background or otherwise. But I, I think you definitely notice that um, 
it does take a little getting used to for the lawyers and for others. And I think it puts a, a little bit of, uh, it makes it important for me to try to do the best job I can because you know this is the first Asian American judge they've dealt with and you want them to come out of it thinking that we as a community can handle this role and we'll do it as well or better than other people because that's how, and it's true in every other sector, whether it's science or business or medicine, if we do well, then we open opportunities for others in the future. And unfortunately, even though it's not fair, if we don't do well, sometimes that um, has a negative impact on the rest of the community to, to a large degree because our numbers are small. We're, we're all in this together. Thank you. Any other question out there? Uh, I have a question about uh, what do you think in your Asian American as an individual or as a, a team or society in your experience? What do you think about that? About Asian Americans as working together? Or, yes, or uh, as an individual. You mean like Chinese Americans and uh, different groups or as individual Chinese, people? Chinese American. Well, so I, I think it's an interesting thing that um, you know, as we all know, uh, people from different parts of Asia obviously have different traditions and cultures, whether it's Chinese American, Japanese American, Korean, or, or Indian American. But I think for those of us, and I think Professor Wu talked about this when we first started, those of us who grew up here and get out into the world, we realize, first of all, there's not enough of us to uh, do things by ourselves. Um, we do need to work together with others who have common interests, whether it's Asian Americans or other minorities like African Americans or Latinos uh, or other groups. And the other thing is we have a lot in common too. Um, even though perhaps back in Asia there were a lot of disputes among countries or even among the Chinese community, depending on the politics of the last hundred years, um, when we're here we all face very similar issues, whether it's being treated as a foreigner, um, whether it's the uh, educational uh, emphasis or the uh, difficulty of moving up to senior management. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a Chinese American or Korean American or Indian American. So I have found that uh, although our individual interests as Chinese Americans are important and we need to focus on them, and that's why this organization is so great, um, we also need to work together as a group on the, with the common interests and many of the organizations I've been involved in are pan-Asian American and we're much more effective when we work together and I think we learn a lot from each other um, and so I think being involved in that broader community and working together as that broader community is very important. I have a couple of questions. First of all, I appreciate really everything you have said in the talk. And uh, many of us realize that as first generation Chinese American, lack of understanding of our judiciary system has put us, many of us, in a huge disadvantage. It's very clear from the recent FBI development attack on the Chinese American community. And so my first question is, uh, what's the best way for some of us to learn the system? You know, the judicial system is very complex with many positions in place. Fortunately, uh, many Asian Americans are running for position in the November election. But for the general public, what's the best way for them to learn the system? And my second question is very simple. How many Asian American judges have been appointed by Trump administration this time? Okay, well, let me just, uh, I'll answer the second one first. Um, and, and actually, I think it's good news. I, I think that um, although there's been, I think, some discussion about the diversity of the appointees by President Trump, uh, he's um, appointed several Asian Americans already. He appointed two Asian Americans to the Courts of Appeals, uh, which is the uh, second highest level below the Supreme Court. One uh, judge in Texas who's Chinese American, another uh, in Kentucky who I believe has Japanese American roots. Um, He's appointed another uh, judge in, I think, a, two Japanese-American judges, one from Hawaii and one from another part of Texas. Um, so I believe it's four or five already. And, you know, I think that speaks well of our community generally. Um, I think with President Obama appointing about 22 judges, I think it's, it, it changes what people expect. And it's no longer unusual to appoint Asian-Americans. and. I think a lot of the Asian American legal groups, bar associations, work in a bipartisan way where they try to help the uh, nominees under Democratic presidents and the nominees under Republican presidents and work together. And I think that's been successful. There was support uh, during the Obama administration from 
Republican or conservative Asian Americans and I think liberal or Democratic Asian Americans are supporting these nominees um, that President Trump is appointing. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and then on the other question of how you learn about the justice system, I think one way I think that, can, that this can work is to really partner with organizations that focus on that. Um, you know, a lot of the Asian American bar associations around the country, including the national organization, uh, NAPABA, and the ones here in, uh, in local communities, whether in Washington, D.C., or New York, and California, uh, these are groups of Asian American lawyers who, because they're in the organization, they care about these kinds of issues. And I think one thing that can happen is to try to build partnerships with those organizations. And those members can do s workshops or seminars um, come speak to non-lawyer Asian American groups about how the system works. And I think that would be uh, a great opportunity not just to learn about the justice system, but again to build stronger relationships across different parts of our community. Hi, you know, Shin from Michigan. I have a question about the uh, uh, state and local judges because the, um, when we uh, go to uh, the port for election, a lot of times we uh, need to elect judges, like, okay, pick 18 from the 18 people listed. And a lot of times I felt really bad, because even uh, if I do some research, I cannot find that uh, there's a good choice for these things. Uh, do you think this is the right system, and uh, how do we change that? Thank you. Well, actually, I think in most states, the uh, judges are elected, although they're not always elected directly, because what happens is whenever there's a vacancy between elections, which is pretty much when vacancies occur, in many states, including Maryland, where I'm from, and Massachusetts, where I'm originally from, I know that uh, judges are appointed by the governor to complete the term. And then once they're in that position, then they get on the ballot to run, and usually there's not a lot of people running against them. So. What I think uh, we've seen is that if you're an Asian American lawyer and you can get through the governor's process in various states to get appointed to fill out those terms, then that puts you in a very strong position to stay in that position. So I think having uh, our local community groups, the legal, the bar associations, but also other uh, Asian American groups supporting people who are going through that process to get appointed by governors uh, is a very helpful way to get them in a position where they can be on the ballot. I think obviously there's disagreements on how it should be done. Uh, the founders of our, you know, the framers of the Constitution decided that election of judges was not a good idea. They felt like it would make judges too beholden to the political process and public opinion rather than deciding cases on the law. But it is a democratic country, and many states do it that way. Uh, it would have to take a, a movement state by state to uh, change the, the rules in those states. But in many cases, like I said, the elections are. Uh, they follow up a governor's appointment. So there is a way to uh, help people get through the process without going through an election. There's some people in the back, too, I think. Hello. Hi, Judge. Uh, uh, my name is Hua Wan. I'm from Lexington, Massachusetts. Thank you. That's and great. Uh, so I mean, I'm very curious uh, for you to describe your growing experience in, Massachusetts, in Lexington, because Lexington now is a uh, perhaps quite different from where you were there because now it's the one of the most sought after town in the entire Massachusetts, maybe in the nation. And thank you. So did you go to the high school there? Uh, no, I didn't, but my kids just did. Okay, great. So, um, you know, I've heard about this. My parents still live in Lexington, Massachusetts, and it's uh, got a very good reputation for public schools, so that attracts uh, a lot of people, particularly Asian Americans. My understanding is now the schools are now about 30% Asian American or something like that. When I was there, it was, um, well, uh, when I was in elementary school, there was me and another Chinese uh, girl. And I still remember in second grade, it was, I think, 1976, and the Olympics were happening, and they uh, decided that uh, they would have one person from each uh, one, one student carried the flag of each country in the Olympics, but then they decided that since we were the two Chinese people, we had to carry the China flag, um, just because they thought that would be fun. Um, and so once you get to middle school and high school, there are a few more coming in from the other schools, but um, I think by high school, there were probably about 20 of us. Uh, that's Asian Americans overall, Chinese Americans. Um, I mean, put it this way, the, uh, the three other Chinese American guys I'm still sort of friends with, like, just because, even though I wasn't necessarily, they weren't my closest friends, they were people who I met 
and you just have a connection that you, that stays with you. But you know, uh, I think it was a great. It, what one has to remember is whether you grow up in California or on the East Coast, what the, whatever the community is. There's a lot of great, um, good, good-hearted Americans everywhere, and the fact that I was one of few really didn't hold me back. Um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I ended up getting elected to a position in the town government um, when I was in college. I was the student representative to the school committee, so it wasn't that I couldn't do things. Um, people were open-minded if you give them a chance, and so I think people shouldn't shy away from uh, trying to be involved in whatever they want to be involved in um, because uh, there aren't that many people who look like you. Um, so by the, for the most part, it was a very good experience, but as I said, um, there's always people who will make comments and there's always people who don't understand why you're here or where you actually fit in and uh, and obviously that's something that we all go through but it, but it you know I, I love that town I, I actually have a, a picture of the um, battle green in my chambers right now so uh, I have a lot of very positive feelings about Massachusetts and Lexington thank you very much that's